a sower went out to sow seeds in the field. Some seeds fell on rocky ground, and they were scorched. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns choked them. And some fell on good soil and produced grain. And Jesus taught them, saying, If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, upon finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Hey, good morning. Uh, it's really good to be with you. My name is JC. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, as best I can remember, I've been on two hot air balloon rides. Uh, I'm sure you were like, I was thinking about the same thing this morning. Uh, the first was at Windsor Square. They were opening up a new, do- a new movie theater. Uh, since that movie theater became like the dollar theater, then it became like the I wonder what's growing in the carpet of this theater. If any of you have been there, it's now closed down, which tells you I'm getting old. But if you're like old school Knoxville, you remember like when it opened, it was like, man, we are expanding westward, guys. This is exciting. Well, when they opened up this theater, I still don't really know why, but somebody was like, you know what we should do as we open up a theater? Have hot air balloon rides in the parking lot. And if you were on that team, Uh, I would love to talk to you. If you need prayer, that'd be awesome. But if you just want to tell me the story of how you all decided hot air balloon rides for the opening of a theater, I'm intrigued. But I remember we showed up in the parking lot. There was a line. We waited in said line, kind of climbed over this wicker basket. (sighs) Hot air. We went up. We kind of peered out over... Not much, but a little bit of West Knoxville. And you're like, wow, this is fascinating. I'm gonna see a movie here in just a moment. Uh, And then you kind of floated back down because there were some large concrete blocks holding this hot air balloon very sturdily in place. And so it was pretty, it was not exciting at all, actually. I'm still so confused that I've even done this in my life in Knoxville, Tennessee, but I did. The other hot air balloon ride was very different. It involved an early morning before sunrise Jeep ride over very bumpy terrain. Uh, Me, myself, me and myself, and I, my mom, and there was like seven or eight of us. Most of them were me, but whatever. Uh, (laughs) We're using first service. For anybody that asks, first service is going live. Um, So it was me, my mom and my dad, bumpy car ride, Jeep ride. We get out, we get into a much larger wicker basket with a few other people. We climb in, they start filling it up. It fills up with a lot more air. And we take a hot air balloon ride over the Serengeti in Tanzania. And it was amazing. I mean, as they start loading that thing up with air, there was expectation as soon as air started filling the balloon. Now, Knoxville, Tennessee, West Knoxville, I mean, Praise God, right? What he's doing here, fantastic. But the hot air balloon over the Serengeti, there was just a different level of expectation as soon as the air started to fill the balloon. And so as we rose a little bit, it was a calm morning and we were able to go up high. And as we're in this basket looking over the edge, you could see animals below all the things that you go to Tanzania to see. And at times we were so high, they almost seemed ant-like, just doing what they do on the ground below. And then we let some of the hot air go out of the balloon and we'd kind of sink down a little bit. And it was almost like we were just on top of the treetops watching giraffes and the animals doing what they're doing. And it was fantastic. Now at the end of both nights, I could have put my head on my pillow and said, I went on a hot air balloon ride today. And I would not have been lying to anybody that was listening in my bed. That's weird. But it would not have been, I would have been telling the truth. Like I went on a hot air balloon ride West Knoxville, Windsor Square, Serengeti, Tanzania. It would be true. But that's where the similarities stop, right? I mean, other than that, the differences are vast. Knoxville is kind of like, go up. This is pretty neat. Let's get back down. I've got a movie and some popcorn in a few minutes. Serengeti, there was expectation. There was hope. There was what might happen. What might we see? 
There was a little nerves too. Like, what if a big gust of wind, like I'm not really familiar with aerodynamics and how things move and all that. Like, I'm just holding on tight. I do remember my sisters and I in this hot air balloon, like kind of looking at each other like, oh, cool, Knoxville. But I remember my mom and my dad and I looking at each other like, can you believe this? This is amazing. Well, as I've been thinking about those rides for the last couple of weeks, I've thought some about my own walk with Christ. And I've thought even more about us as a church. And I've just wondered, if you were to take your life with Christ or maybe my life with Christ and say, which one is it? Are you kind of going up and you're seeing the sights? But you're pretty set in your ways and you kind of come right back down. Or are you following God in such a way where when you wake up, there's an expectation, there's an excitement, there's a wonder what might happen with my life even today. And there's almost like a excitement around him. There's a freedom around him, you could even say. And part of my fear is that as a church, some of us think of this place, me leading the way, more so like the first hot air balloon ride. We show up, we get into the parking lot, we do what we're supposed to do, kids are dropped off, we come into the room, we climb into our little basket, and then we kind of ask the question, so what are we gonna do today? Who's leading the songs? Do we like the songs? A harp, that's interesting. Where's the bass drum? Like, Can we get a little bit more of that? And kind of cranks up a little bit. We're like, oh, this is fascinating. Oh, look who's preaching today. More notes, less notes. More exciting, less exciting. And I'm not making any comments on anybody. I'm just saying like, that's kind of our technique, right? Like, what's this gonna be like? How high are we gonna go? Okay, now let's all come back down and get back into our nice little comfortable cars and go home. But what would it look like for a church to show up going, no, we believe that God's gonna take us to a place we can't go by ourselves." And I'm not talking about the hundreds of us in the room. I'm talking about like you. Like, what might God wanna do in your life? That's not just get in, go up and go down. But that's like, I'm gonna trust God to take me someplace that's it's gonna require something of me. What would it look like for us as a community of believers? And for me, primarily, my wife and my kids. So like, look at them and not go, get in. It's up and down, up and down. But like, for me to really believe with my wife, God's gonna take us to places where we're gonna go, we're a little uncomfortable here. This is not exactly the path we would have taken. This is not exactly the decisions we would have chosen in and of ourselves. But if we're gonna be a free people, this is what it's gonna look like to follow after God. And so the question is, so what is that? How do we become the free people of God? What would it look like to be in step with the kingdom of God as the people of God? Well, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is speaking and he's talking to the disciples. The disciples have come up and they ask a question. And I, as I've studied and as I've kind of looked at it myself, believe that all of chapter 18 is Jesus making one answer to their question. Rick started us last week, and if you weren't here, I'd really recommend that you go and listen to Rick talk about what it is to be um, childlike in your faith versus childish. Because that's the first thing Jesus does. The question that the disciples show up and ask is, hey, who's gonna be the greatest? We wanna know like who's gonna be greatest in the kingdom of God. Now, it's really easy to have two extremes for the disciples. One, that they were just like clamoring for greatness. Man, we wanna be great, Jesus. We wanna sit at your left and at your right. We wanna do that. And I do believe that that's part of what the disciples were asking. I also wonder if deep down, God through Jesus and the spirit were already starting to kind of disrupt them, disrupt them in some ways that they were going, hey, who's gonna be great in the kingdom? Because everything else you've taught us has like flipped our thinking on its head. So we're curious if even when we say, who's gonna be the greatest among us? We're going, we're probably thinking about this wrong, Right? I think we gotta give them grace that they weren't just like, we wanna be awesome. I know that that was part of it because it's part of me. But I also wanna give the disciples a little grace that maybe we're going, Jesus, who's gonna be great? We don't understand your ways. And so last week, Rick started by saying, he said, well, bring some of these kids around here. You gotta have childlike faith. If you wanna be great in the kingdom of God, if you wanna be free in the kingdom of God, have a faith like a child that just says, I can't understand it all. And I'm I'm very aware that this is much bigger than me, but I believe that there's a heavenly father who can do more than I could ask or imagine. And what he said is true. 
and he's gonna do it. So if you wanna be great, take the posture of a child. Humble yourself, admit you're weak, and just trust that God's gonna do something with your life. And so then I think they would have been going, okay, so if we wanna be great, it's gonna be the little ones. And I think he would have said, yeah, little ones, not only in stature, but in heart. And then I believe Jesus continues to answer the question. What's it like to be great? What's it like to be free? What's it like to be a fully alive son or daughter of God? What would that look like for us? He goes, well, I'll tell you. And there are gonna be four things. And each one of these things that he points out is gonna completely rub up against, bump into and collide with your and my selfish hearts, my sinful heart. But if we love him, we say, God, teach us your ways. And he says, okay, if you wanna be free, if you wanna be great in the kingdom, this is it. Now, as we start, I want you to rem remember that he's talking with kids right around him. So as soon as we start reading some of these verses, you might slip back into the church you grew up in. Or maybe there's a preacher online that you always hear through this tone of like just frustration disappointment in you. And I just want to remind you that this is Jesus, the Savior, sitting with kids around going, all right, I'll answer your question. Who's gonna be great? But here's what he says next, Matthew chapter 18, if you have a Bible, verses seven and eight. He says, woe to the world for temptation to sin. For it's necessary that temptation come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. See how quickly you can drift, at least I do, drift back into Jesus just being so mad. Hey, who's gonna be the greatest? Well, let me tell you, it's gonna be like the kids. And cut off your hand. Like, wouldn't you be like, good grief, Jesus. Like, chill out, man. Like, what just happened there? Do, doesn't it make a lot more sense for Jesus to go like, hey, if you wanna be great in the kingdom of God, it's gonna be like childlike faith. And woe to you if you deal with sin. Like, doesn't it make so much more sense for your heavenly father, for your savior, for my savior to go, if you wanna know what greatness is, it's childlike. And I am pleading with you, don't mess with sin. Don't ever think you've grown past it. Don't ever think, well, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, sure, middle school happened. And sure, in college, I got into that. But that's not that big of a deal. He's going, no, 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 woe to you if you ever make light of sin. If you really wanna know what greatness is and if you really wanna know how to cut the strings that are tethering you, you cannot take sin lightly. Cut off your hand or your foot if it causes you to sin. Now, clearly we know Jesus didn't mean physically go cut off your hands, go cut off your feet. All of us would have shown up handless and footless today, right? Maybe, well, not me. Well, you don't have a tongue because you lie a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> but surely he doesn't mean that. Why? Because he's already said this same phrase in the Sermon on the Mount. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. But what was the whole Sermon on the Mount saying? Hey, you can't externally change your life and get rid of sin. It's gotta be an internal just disruption by the Spirit of God. If you really want sin to be ended in your life, it's not just, a, well, I'm gonna quit doing that. I'm gonna quit doing this. I'm gonna cut that off. I'm gonna cut that out. I'm gonna put filters everywhere. And there's wisdom. But some of us just keep believing, if I can just change my exterior enough, this burden that I carry will go away. And Jesus is going, no, no, no. That's not it. But what he is saying is you've got to deal with sin. If you've just become comfortable with sin, he's kind of riding in your sidecar. You've just kind of made a bed with the sins of your life. He's going, it's not greatness in the kingdom of God. It's not being set free in the kingdom of God. Cut it out. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet than to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, again, that might be where some of the TV preachers come on and you're like, oh, here he goes. 
This is not a mean preacher. This is your savior pleading with you. If you have sin in your life, don't hide it. It will destroy you. If you have sin in your life, come to me and confess to me. I died on the cross knowing this was gonna be the sin you were gonna be struggling with. Bring it to me. Don't try to clean it up yourself. So I think Jesus would say, hey, if you wanna know what greatness is and if you wanna know what a free life is, humbly like a child, come to your father going, this one's too big for me. I'm tempted to cut off my hands. I'm I'm tempted to pluck out my eyes, but I'm very aware that I can cover and I can shield and I can neglect all I want. But if you don't do work on my heart, I I am done. Now we are a part of this. Our will is a part of our sin. So it's not just praying, God, get rid of that, but I'm gonna keep living the way I've always lived. Woe to you if you do that. He's saying, make every effort that you can and then be very certain only grace is gonna change you. God, who's gonna be the greatest? What's gonna be the one that goes, now I'll go to any extreme. Very simply, about 10 months ago, we were on a family trip, just the five of us, and uh, I found myself constantly comparing myself to other people on a device. My family, just the five of us, went to a part of the country we'd never been to before, and it was fantastic. And every night I would get in bed next to my beautiful wife and scroll other people's lives. And I'd be like, man, we've never been here before. We're having a blast, but look at what they're doing. And maybe it's just me. I would literally think, you know what tomorrow I'm gonna do? I'm gonna try to position my family to look just like that, but in a unique location and be like, yeah, 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 I've been there, done that. Never been here before and we're all smiling about it too. And I just started realizing, man, comparison was deep in me. And so I got rid of social media. And some of you are like, oh, great, here we go, the social media talk. I'm not here to tell you to get rid of social media. Some of you may be going, actually, it's my job, please don't. Uh, That's fine, whatever. But for me, it was one of those things. I just, again, not audibly, but just like one of those, hey, are you gonna take sin seriously or are you just gonna be like, that's not that, I'm not doing anything grotesque. But even as I say that, don't you go, that's true, you're just comparing. Okay, so when, when does grotesque begin? I was not like in a deep chat room talking to people I didn't know. I was not deep into pornography. I was just comparing to other people and we go, well, I mean, that's okay, isn't it? I, I don't think so. But man, the culture's telling me it is. And I'm not telling you what you have to do. But for me, I really felt like the Lord's like, hey, you need a break from this. So I was like, I know what I'll do. Uh, I'll take it off my phones. And social media was like, well, that's adorable. We'll find other ways into your life. So then like my watch is telling me stuff. My computer's telling me stuff. And I was like, yeah, this is much better. I was like, what was I supposed to do today? Not this. And you know, I just found myself in a whole nother venue finding myself comparing to other people. So then I was like, I've got to get out of this world which is basically like buying a house these days because it was 37 signatures. Are you sure you wanna do this? And I was like, yes, submit. Would you like a free trial? I was like, free trial, I just quit, you know? But it was like amazing to me what the culture was going, no, you need this in your life. You can just leave everything the way it is and in 60 days, we'll remind you that we're here and all your memories will be saved. And I was like, that does sound like a good option. And I was like, no, this is not what I wanna be doing. So I had to cut it out. I'm not telling you to, but for me, it was one of the things that I just went, I can't keep playing games with this and just go, but it's not that big of a deal. Is it worth getting the raise if money becomes even more of an idol? You're like, let's go back to the social media one. (laughs) Is it worth having the relationship if you're regularly sexually active with somebody you shouldn't be. But I'm not lonely. Is it worth being connected to others if you're actually envious of them, but then when you see them face to face, you smile? Greatness in the kingdom of God is so different. To what extent will we go to say, God, you're holy. You are worthy. 
Your heavenly father's pleading with you and with me. Cut it out. You'll find life. So then you'd be going, all right, so I wonder what Jesus would think is a big area that I need freedom in. I wanna be great and I wanna be set free. Well, then do work with your sin. I wonder what kind of sin he'd want me to do work with. I'm just reading the next verse. See to it that you not despise one of these little ones, the people in the faith who are growing. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my fathers who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? This passage is famously in Luke and in Matthew, the one that we're reading right now. In Luke, uh, a lot of the scholars think it was much more evangelistic because the language that Luke uses is there was a lost sheep. In Matthew, it's a different Greek word. And he talks about, in Matthew, he says the sheep has gone astray. So apparently the sheep was there, now he's gone astray. So a lot of people say Luke was evangelistic, Matthew was more discipleship, going how do you deal with the people in your life So here comes the kicker. I think Jesus was teaching and he was going, hey, if you wanna be great in the kingdom of God, you gotta deal with sin. If you wanna be great in the the kingdom of God, you gotta deal with sin and I need you to deal with relational sin. Now you might be going, no, this verse is about how God came and found me. I was the sheep out on the hillside all by myself and God said, you know what? I'm leaving the 99 good people and I'm gonna go find the one. And that's absolutely true. If you don't know that today, you have a God, you have a savior, we believe, that has left the 99 to go say, I will find the one no matter how far you've gone, no matter how dark the tunnel is. He says, I'm not scared of the dark. I will come into that place and find you. But wouldn't it make sense that if we have a God who we will sing songs about this verse and say, absolutely, he leaves the 99 to find the one. Wouldn't it make sense that your God and my God would say, and you too. Leave the comfort of those you're most comfortable with and find the one that you've got relational tension with. Again, can we go back to the social media thing? This is hard. I mean, I, I, I wish I could tell you how much this week I went. Is there any other way to talk about this verse? But doesn't it make sense? Your heavenly father says, I will go after the one. You wanna be great in the kingdom of God, you'd be like me. You find the people in your life that have gone astray and you go and find them. Oh, but God, that seems, I mean, this is gonna be hard. Yeah, kind of like, cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye, yeah, this is gonna require a lot of grace. So even as I talk about this, maybe there's a person that you're thinking about and you're going, yeah, I'm sure I should, but not, not that person. Maybe some of you are thinking back to middle school and you're like, my gosh, I got a lot of people to go hunt down. Maybe. And maybe in your mind, you're like, yeah, but I gotta read the Bible verses and I gotta get in a life group and I gotta do all the stuff. And you should, we're big supporters of all that. But what if the people of God said, we are gonna be relentless of going after the people that have gone astray? What would Fellowship Church look like if we said, we are gonna be just like our Heavenly Father and we are gonna pursue those who have gone astray? Can you imagine? If he finds it, Truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So it is about your heavenly father going, I don't want people to get lost in this. It's the will of our heavenly father that people don't perish because of their sin. And so we get to reflect that and say, who am I gonna go after? Maybe you're saying, you know, JC, I've heard that verse preached a lot of different ways. I think I like it better when it talks about Jesus coming after me. I'm just reading the next verse. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
I think it makes a lot of sense that Jesus would be teaching and they're going, how do we become great? He says, deal with your sin, particularly the relational sin. Go after that person, that they're on the outskirts, they're hard for you. Your little group kind of believes these certain things and you're kind of comfortable with them. And this, this person, they were kind of around for a while, but now all of a sudden they believe something different and they've become part of them. They're the, they are now the they's. He says, you better go after him. Are you sure that's what it means? Well, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. Now in our world, everything is public. Everything is promoted. So to even think about doing this, particularly at a large church is difficult. Wait, so you're, you're telling me I'm supposed to go and find people that I know are living in sinful ways that if they're either sinning against others or sinning against me, I'm supposed to go and find them and talk to them about that. Well, you ask a question about what greatness is. And I'm just telling you, if you wanna be great, yeah, you pursue those who have offended you or that you know are living in sin and, and you call it out in them. Oh my goodness, Jesus, this is gonna be so countercultural. Yeah, what if the church stood out because of the crazy way we went after those who had gone astray. And when we found them, we said, hey, it's just me and you here. I have not talked to a lot of other people about this. This is between me and you, brother or sister. I just wanna tell you what I'm seeing in your life or the way that it's affected me. And I wanna call it out. And maybe you say, well, I tried that, it didn't work. Let's keep reading. And if he listens, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the witnesses of two or three witnesses. So what does Jesus say? He says, well, then get the community because this is how much it matters to me. Find other people that will go with you. Find other people that will go, hey, we're not doing this to kind of point out how bad you are. We're doing this because the first verses we looked at are serious, like sin matters to God. And we're seeing that we've been relating in a sinful way and we just can't act like it doesn't matter and just brush it under the rug. We're here to tell you like, this really matters. And there's a couple of us here and we're not trying to team up on you. We're pleading with you. Forgive us for the way that we've abandoned you. Forgive us for the way we've talked about you when you weren't even around. Forgive us. Like we're leading with what we've done, but we, we do not love you well if we don't tell you what we see in your life. This week, as I was preparing for the message, uh, as you can imagine, there was a Rolodex of people in my head that I thought, what if they randomly visited Fellowship Church today? Like people from high school, not people that are like, oh, you're a pastor at Fellowship Church, but like people that have not seen me in a while, they're like back in town, Fellowship Church, and they're like, that joker, he's the guy that's gonna be up there? And I thought, you know, I don't have time to write all those letters, but I do know a few. And so this week I wrote letters. Some of you are not, well, some of them go to this church. I almost said their names and that would have been like, well, this just became very public. Um, (laughs) And I wasn't like, hey, are you aware? You're a jerk. I was, hey, um, I have not honored you in the way I should have. Uh, You are somebody that's had a big impact and I just kind of let it go. And I apologize. Now, again, that is so, you may be going, it says go to him, JC. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm trying, (laughs) you know. Um, But what I'm trying to give you an example of is just, it is hard. And I knew that in this week, I couldn't actually get to certain people, but I thought, you know what I can do is not just an email, not just a text, nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But I thought, man, I want it to be written down. Hey, I'm pursuing you. I didn't tell him that, but I just said, I want you to know I apologize that I haven't honored you the way I should have. I haven't talked to you the way that I probably should have. So I sent some notes. Just going, I can't stand up here and be like, let's do this. And be like, but there are people in my life I'm just not. And maybe you're going, well, what would this really look like for me? The thing I would really want you to hear is that Jesus says, take two or three people. I want you to have the confidence that when you show up in the life of other people, if Christ is in you, you are showing up and you are the full body of Christ. You and a couple of other people around your friend pursuing reconciliation, that is greatness in the eyes of God. 
He did not say, well, when a bunch of people get together, that's gonna be great. He says, if you wanna know what greatness is, it's when you go to your brother or your sister and say, can I talk to you about sins? And if it doesn't work, take two or three more with you. It's gonna be great in his eyes. Next verse, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. One point of clarity here, and I do wanna talk about our church and the way that we handle some of these things. When you read that, you might say, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. You're like, well, that's fantastic. I'm about to start sending out some emails right now. Dear church, my neighbor's mean. Dear church, my life group leader's not doing too great. Dear, you know, like, and that is it. But I also wanna make sure we're all clear that when Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he says, and if they don't listen, tell it to the church, they would have no understanding of big green roofs and padded chairs when you say church. They would have been thinking the people, the community that's right around them, that's their church. Go to that group of people and say, we need to talk to this brother or sister. So absolutely bring stuff to us, please. Every Sunday morning, we have elders down here and they are not just waiting for you to come down and confess some grotesque thing or some amazing like wow moment. At times, they're just hoping and praying that you might come down and say, hey, I've got a relationship that's in real struggle right now. Would you pray? Hey, I've got somebody at work that I'm really envious of. Would you pray for me? Hey, my wife and I, we're just kind of like ships in the night. Would you pray for us? We don't wait until the ship has crashed to ask for help. Doesn't it make more sense that Christians would be coming forward going, I need help. I've got people, in my, I, people live around me. I need help. Would you help me? But if you do come to this church and you need help, our elders take this very seriously. They have put together a team called the Congregational Care Team and their very desire is that if you are in a situation where sin is so divisive that you're going, we just can't reconcile. We wanna have a team that goes, we'll walk with you. The desire is not that we could like point fingers or blame. Our desire is that we could go, hey, can we get people together in the room that are believers and go, is there any way by God's grace to reconcile this? Because even though we're large and it would be very easy just to be like, oh, well, let's not worry about it. We go, no, that's not the call of scripture. If we're gonna be great, we wanna do the things that our heavenly father is asking us to. Again, I say to you, the next verse, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Again, this verse has been used in a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of times, small groups will use it and they'll be like, well, you know, there's two or three of us here, so Jesus is with us, let's roll. A lot of times, as pastors, we use it when we're like we plan an event, we think, oh, there's gonna be a lot of people. And then not a lot of people show up. We're like, hey, it doesn't matter. It matters to us. It doesn't matter. There's two or three here, let's roll, right? We use this sometimes out of context because he was talking about uh, the church and disagreements and loving your brother, going after the lost sheep. And he's going, hey, if you get together and agree, if you ask, I'll do it for you. The inverse is also true, I think is what he's saying. If two or three of you are not agreeing on something, I'm not in that. And I'm not saying there's not room for disagreement. What I'm saying is if two or three of you are living in sin and you're not willing to address it, I'm not a part of that as your heavenly father. but he does say, I'll be among them. My hope for many of you is that you will find Fellowship Church to be home for you, that it'll be a spiritual community that you love and you find connection. But I do wanna tell you that our, our Heavenly Father says where two or three are gathered, I'm with them. If you, please, I hope there's not judgment in this, but if there are not moments where just two or three of you are together talking about the Lord and your life lights up, If you only find yourself loving the Lord in this place, you may not love the Lord, you may love a crowd. And if you never worship the Lord with like a smaller group, and I'm not even talking about musically, but like you just go, man, that was worshipful. The way we were talking, the way we were relating, like I just love the Lord. 
If you never worship the Lord apart from in this room, you may not love Jesus, you may love a drum. If you never turn your affection towards Jesus in the way that you relate to those right around you, this is the hardest one. You may not love Jesus, you might just love a church. And I'm just begging some of you this morning to confess, Jesus, I love the stuff of the church more than I love you. There's not shame, there's invitation. Come on. Some of you don't need to confess these crazy, wild sins. You just need to confess, I love the things of God more than I love God. He'll set you free. Not perfectly. That comes in eternity. But our God is a God of freedom. We know this was hard for the disciples, and we'll wrap up with this because Peter comes up and he says, all right, Lord, we ask you about greatness, and you just talked a whole lot about sin and relating to other people. Uh, how many times should I do this and forgive him? And then I think he looked around. Again, these are real people. They're not storybook figures. I think he probably looked around at the other disciples. And he's like, how many times? Like as many as seven? And they were probably like, oh, way to shoot for the moon there, Peter. Because in Jewish tradition, they were commanded to forgive at least three times. So he's probably going, hey, I'm gonna go to like the perfect number, like the higher number, seven, it's biblical. He's like, what do you think, Jesus? Like seven times, remember, I'm the rock, you just said this earlier, that we're gonna build this church upon. So what are you thinking? Like, how many times should we actually play this out? Seven? And Jesus was a fully human and fully God, and I don't think he just went, no, Peter, I say 77 times. You know, <laughs> I think he would've been like, well, that's, I could see why you do that. Um, but no, it's not even seven, Peter. It's seven times 10, like 77 times, times 11. And they would have been like, oh, Jesus, like this is so crazy. We ask you about greatness and you're saying just again and again and again, fight your sin, go after the one that's difficult and reconcile as best you can. That's what it's like to be great in the kingdom of God. And he says, so I'll end by telling you a story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven. You ask about greatness in the kingdom of heaven? Let me tell you about it. The kingdom of heaven can, can be compared to a king who wished to settle the accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle them, one of them was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, he never would have been able to. His master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Don't forgive that. Don't forget that. And when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, a significant amount less than what he owed. And seizing him, he began to choke him. Doesn't sin choke us? Saying, pay what you owe. Demanding from others what we could never pay ourselves. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw that it had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. This is the, the, literally the story that they just told. They saw sin happening and they went and dealt with it. Then their master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, evil servant. And don't, don't like bristle up at that. Go, yeah, that's true. So when, when God comes before us and goes, hey, you're evil, you're wicked. We don't go, no, I'm not. We go, yeah, I am. In my sin, I am. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had had mercy on you? In anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. And so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. Now you might go, whoa, again, Jesus, you just curveball there. I think he's going, hey, the story doesn't have to end this way, guys. If, if you'll remember that you were forgiven, the story can end differently. 
If you will live a life confident of your forgiveness, you don't have to relate to people the way this servant did in the story. It's possible by my grace for you to live a different life. And so what's it like to be great in the kingdom of God? It's to have a childlike faith. It's to take your sin really seriously. And it's to evaluate your relationships and go, is there anybody who's gone astray and that I just need to be pursuing? And when I find them, how do I talk to them about their sin gently and pray that they would be restored? And then at the base of everything is say, I'm forgiven. What would a forgiven person do? What would somebody do who was absolutely confident they had been forgiven? They would be really serious with their sin because they go, oh, it doesn't define me anymore. What would a person who's forgiven do? They would look around and go, who else is running because of the shame that they feel because of their sin? I'm gonna go after them and say, remember, that's not the gospel. That's not the story we're telling. What would a person who's been forgiven do? They would find their community and go, hey, can we make eye contact and just say, I've sinned against you, you've sinned against me. By God's grace, we can be reconciled. What would a person who's been forgiven do? They would wake up every morning going, God, would you remind me that I've been forgiven? Help me live out of that. Maybe it'll lead to me being great in the kingdom of God. So maybe there's somebody practically in your life that you just know, I need to work on reconciliation there. Maybe it's a sin that's been in your own life where you just go, I am tethered down. I am not free. Or maybe you just need to be reminded today that you have a king who that when you come before him and plead, say, God, please forgive my debt. He goes, I will. If you put your faith in me, I will forgive all of your debts. Be free. Our worship team's gonna come out and just sing. I invite you to think about how mighty our God is. That regardless of how great the divide is, regardless of how extreme it feels for you to come to your heavenly father, we have a God who says, no, I'm mighty to save. My arm is not too short. Jesus, we love you so much. I thank you that you have promised us that you will not leave us. And because of that, we can turn towards whatever is hardest for us right now. Whatever it is that seems to be weighing us down the most, that's stopping us from living a life that's free, you already know it. And so we just come to you and say, Jesus, we love you. And whatever it is that I've brought into this room, whether it be a relational sin, whether it be my own hidden sin, uh, you knew about it. So I can come to you and just say, God, thank you for being a king who has shown us what greatness is. Humility, sacrifice, love, forgiveness. We love you, Jesus. We pray all this in Christ's name.